Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Tracy, do you drink tea? I do. I drink coffee more, but I do drink tea as well. I drink coffee more. I try to incorporate more tea into my uh, my diet, but it's tricky. I tend to default to coffee. But today around the world, people drink tea all the time. And of course, for Great Britain, it's no secret that tea has become part of the cultural identity. We'll talk about some shifts in that at the end. Uh, but right up until the 19th century, the only place that tea was really being grown and prepared was China. So uh, this brings up the question of how did tea become the drink of Britain? And that story is kind of a long one. It comes with some caveats as to where truth and legend overlap. But then there's this really interesting 19th century corporate espionage story that comes into the mix. Uh, So I thought we would talk about that. Kind of the, it's not even a brief history of tea. It's really like Great Britain's relationship with tea as we know it. Yeah. Yeah. We have, there's some things back in the archive that are uh, similarly about tea, but it's totally different in terms of which specific tea things they are discussing. Yeah. So as with a whole lot of food products that have been around for a really long time, we don't really know where the idea to brew tea leaves came from. Uh, There are lots of different speculative stories about its origins, though, and one of the ones that is most frequently cited is the story of Chinese Emperor Shen Nong. And according to the legend, in 2737 BCE, the emperor, who was scientifically pretty knowledgeable, was sitting with a cup of boiled water when a leaf from a nearby camellia dropped into it. And knowing that this wasn't dangerous, the emperor gave it a sip after seeing how the hot water caused the plant to release color into the liquid. And voila, tea was born. There's another story that comes from Buddhist origins. And in that tale, the monk Bodhidharma was wandering and meditating as he traveled for nine years without sleeping. And he sat down to meditate by a tree, but he fell asleep. And he became so angry by his body's weakness and succumbing to sleep that he cut his eyelids off and cast them into the dirt. Uh, There, a tea plant grew up to honor that sacrifice and also provide a natural stimulant. I will step aside and say that this story has always cracked me up because it seems like the least zen thing on earth to cut your eyelids off in anger. Yeah. But that's just me. (laughs) Uh, Tea containers dating back to the third century have been found in China, and some that are possibly even older. And tea is referenced in a poem believed to have been written sometime in the second or first century BCE titled A Contract with a Servant. And the book The Classic of Tea was written by Lu Yu in the eighth century. In short, China's history with tea is a very long and very rich one. Modern tea production is much faster, though. Production is compacted into a 24-hour timeline that starts the moment the tea leaves are picked. The leaves are sorted by size, and then they go through a second inspection to classify them by size, appearance, and what type of tea they will become. For leaves selected and classified to become black tea, they are processed in one of two ways. The so-called orthodox method requires first withering the tea. The leaves are spread out on a wire mesh trough, and air is circulated around them to dry them out. So then these leaves are rolled, and that's what makes them look sort of spindly and twisted. Then they're oxidized and once again laid out in a thin layer in a warm room. As the enzymes and the leaves react with the oxygen in the air, the leaves change colors, and the length of time that they're left to oxidize determines how strong the tea is. So the longer they oxidize, the stronger the tea will be. And then after oxidation, the leaves are dried through a process called firing one more time to remove the remaining moisture and destroy any remaining enzymes. So all reaction processes are halted. And then those tea leaves are ready to be packed up. The second method, which is known as cut, tear, and curl, or CTC, is pretty much the same process. The only real difference is that in the rolling stage, they're put through rollers with sharp teeth that break the leaves down into very tiny fragments. And this enables more tea to be shipped in smaller packing space. That was developed in World War II. 
Yeah, that was for when you were shipping by volume and not weight. Uh, and green tea doesn't go through the oxidation process, though it is steamed or pan-dried to stop enzymatic reactions. Oolong tea is created through sort of a mixed process of bruising the leaves and then letting them go through partial oxidation. And white tea is made the same way green tea is, but only new leaves and buds are used. But all of these processes remained a total mystery to the Western world for quite a long time, even as Europeans and British people in particular were drinking tea as part of their daily routine. So today, it's estimated that about 165 million cups of tea are consumed in Britain every day, whereas coffee, while it has grown in popularity, still only clocks in at around 70 million cups. But that love of tea is hardly a new thing for the British Isles. By the 1800s, tea was already wildly popular in Britain. King Charles II and his Portuguese wife, Catherine of Braganza, are credited with being the ones to bring tea to England in the 1600s. Tea was popular in other countries of Europe already by that time, including in the Netherlands and Portugal. As part of Catherine of Braganza's dowry, ships loaded with luxury goods were sent to England, and among them was a trunk of tea. But while that story points to Catherine as the bringer of tea to England, there is actually mention of tea in England in a diary entry by Samuel Pepys on September 25th of 1660, writing, quote, And afterwards I did send for a cup of tea a china drink, of which I never had drank before, and went away. Now, that diary entry was written almost two years before Catherine arrived in the country, which happened in May of 1662. So even if... The tea was already there. Catherine certainly did love it, and as a royal, she set the trends. There was even a poem written about her and her love of tea for her birthday, the year after she married Charles. The poem was written by Edmund Waller, and it reads, Venus her myrtle, Phoebus has his bays. Tea both excels, which she vouchsafes to praise. The best of queens, the best of herbs, we owe to that bold nation which the way did show to the fair region where the sun doth rise, whose rich productions we so justly prize. The muse's friend, tea, does our fancy aid, regress those vapors which the head invade, and keep the palace of the soul serene, fit on her birthday to salute the queen." Coming up, we're going to talk about the East India Company's interest in tea and how the beverage became even more ingrained in British culture. But first, we're going to go get a cup of tea and pause for a sponsor break. The East India Company, which has come up on the show before, had been established in 1600. And as tea interest grew in England, the company developed a growing interest in the tea trade. The EIC's alliance with King Charles II was fruitful in this regard, as land that had also been part of Catherine's dowry was given to the East India Company by Charles in a long-term rental agreement. And that land was the port city of Bombay, which is modern-day Mumbai. The East India Company used this as their main office for trade with the Far East from that point on. And over time, tea imported from China became a staple in the British Isles. Britain's coffee houses started offering tea to customers in the second half of the 1600s. And as the leaf brewed beverage started surpassing coffee in popularity, the East India Company's monopoly on the tea trade, particularly in the colonies, really shaped Britain's history. Folks who listen to our show will know that the passing of the Tea Act in 1773 was what led to the Boston Tea Party. And then in the 1840s, when Britain was already very deep into its love affair with tea, the beverage experienced another uptick in popularity. And that was, according to common legend, thanks to Anna Russell, the seventh Duchess of Bedford. And as that story goes, Anna felt herself feeling a little run down in the afternoons because the stretch between lunch and late dinner, which at that point was kind of in the eight or nine o'clock hour, was quite long. So she asked her servants to bring her tea and light snacks, and she really found that she liked a little bit of bread and butter with a cup of tea so well that she started doing it as a daily ritual, and she started to invite her friends to join her in the afternoons to take tea. This is when I usually have tea, uh, because I will often want a little pick-me-up, but know that a cup of coffee is going to be too much pick-me-up, so I have tea instead. 
Anna Russell was also a lady-in-waiting to Queen Victoria, and the two of them were friends. So, just as Catherine of Braganza's influence had popularized tea in the first place, Victoria's interest in her friend's idea made afternoon tea a trendy activity among first the aristocracy and then the rest of Britain. It also evolved from a simple snack of bread and butter uh, with some tea into more of an afternoon meal that could feature finger sandwiches and pastries. However, it is worth noting that similar to the way that Catherine gets credit for bringing tea to England when it had actually already been there, there do seem to be mentions of afternoon tea as a ritual and a social event prior to Anna's alleged invention of it, dating all the way back to the mid-1700s. So it's likely that really Anna's high social profile simply led to her tea parties kind of getting more historical attention. Uh, There's also some discussion of how that kind of launched a whole industry of like China specifically for teas. So it may be just that kind of economic driver that makes this the story. And it is also a cute story about this hungry lady who then invents this extra meal and has her friends over. So it's it's understandable that that caught on. That reminds me of our podcast about the brief history of white weddings where we talk about the development of China sets to be sold to brides and, like, creating the idea... That you needed that. <laughs> you super, super do. You don't. You don't need that. But this very brief history of tea in Britain is really intended to set the stage for the meaty part of this story, which is starting in the mid-1800s, at which point tea had become vital to Britain's identity. But at the time, all tea was still being exported from China. The East India Company did not like being forced to deal with one country for an item that was so important to Britain. They saw this as a fundamental imbalance. An early effort to reverse this imbalance was by exporting opium to China. I just want to say opium for tea is not an equivalent trade. (laughs) No, and it's more complicated than that, right? It wasn't like they were trading directly to China. They were trading the opium to people for silver, and then that opium was being sold in China, and it completely messed up the Chinese market. Yeah, it led to, like, enormous problems with addiction. Like, this was this was not a good way to try to get a better trade deal over tea. And it led to the first opium war, which was fought between Britain and China as China tried to make Britain stop illegally sending them opium. And we're going to uh, come back to the first opium war briefly. We're not going to get super deep into it. That is a whole other matter on its own. But first, we have to actually introduce a man into the story named Robert Fortune. So Robert Fortune was born in Berwickshire, Scotland on September 16th, 1813 to a farming family. He grew up to become a botanist and he worked at the Edinburgh Botanical Garden and the Royal Horticultural Society. In 1842, he embarked on a plant-finding expedition in China on behalf of the Royal Horticultural Society. The First Opium War had just ended at this point with the signing of the Treaty of Nanking, and Britain immediately took advantage of its greater trade footprint in China, and Fortune's trip was part of that. All of China was not open to foreigners at this point, but Fortune on this journey had traveled right up to the edges of the boundaries of those forbidden areas as he sought out plants. It was the first of several journeys, and he wrote several books about these travels, filled not only with horticultural and botanical information, but also riveting stories of pirates and danger and dressing in disguise to hide his European origins. The stories in his first published travel journal, Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China, became really popular in Britain's society circles, and then it got the attention of the East India Company. Yeah, that's a fascinating read because they're, I mean, it it reads, <laughs> it's borderline Horatio Alger, except with a much chiller tone because it is very like there are bandits and he's, you know, kept sick in the hold of a boat. He doesn't think he's going to ever get back to England. He thinks he's going to die there. And it's pretty exciting stuff. Because Fortune had experience traveling to China, he was the natural choice for the East India Company to send on a mission of utmost importance. They needed someone to be a tea spy. 
If they could gather the secrets of China's tea industry and gather some plants in the process, those plants could then be grown in India and the East India Company would be able to bypass China for its tea needs, breaking the years and years old trade monopoly and creating its own revenue stream. This entire idea is really emblematic to me of the East India Company's whole attitude toward China. And really the British Empire's attitude toward China, like the, the Treaty of Nanking that we referenced earlier was basically a treaty that gave that gave Britain all of the benefit and China zero of the benefit. For and sure. So it was just basically like, hey, you have this thing. We should have it. So we're going to come take it. <laughs> there is an attitude of let's take it. Like that seems to be the solution to every problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Fortune had already made some tea discoveries on his previous travels. He had found the rather surprising information that green tea and black tea actually came from the same type of plant. Although generally those used for black tea were grown in different areas than those used for green tea. Additionally, some of the bushes were revered for their age and the quality of leaves that they produced, but they were still the same species, Camellia sinensis. This was a huge revelation and one that contradicted commonly held beliefs at the time among British botanists, and I would say people that drink tea today but don't necessarily know a lot of tea about tea today might come to the same conclusion that the green tea and the black tea that they have had are two different plants because they taste so different. Yeah. And the scientific minds of Britain had been hard at work trying to suss out the nature of China's tea industry. And they had spent more than a century at that point examining tea leaves to try to discern the nature of the plants that produced the drink that had become so beloved. They basically were looking at processed tea leaves and trying to backwards engineer what kind of plants they thought they came from. So prior to Fortune's observations abroad, it was firmly believed that the plants that produced different types of tea were related but had to be different. But even with this new information found by Fortune, the multiple steps in processing tea remained a complete mystery to the British, and so did actual plant samples. Here is the direction that Fortune received. Quote, Besides the collection of tea plants and seeds from the best localities for transmission to India, it will be your duty to avail yourself of every opportunity of acquiring information as to the cultivation of the tea plant and the manufacture of tea as practiced by the Chinese and on all other points with which it may be desirable that those entrusted with the superintendents of the tea nurseries in India should be made acquainted. So we're going to delve into this mission and how it played out and how it impacted international trade, really, after we first pause for a little sponsor break. So right before the break, we talked about how Robert Fortune had gotten this mission from the East India Trade Company. And this was not a quick get in, get the information, get out situation. It was going to be a lengthy trip away from his wife, Jane, and their two children, Helen and John. Helen, the older of the two children, was just seven in 1848 when this all happened, and John was only four. So Robert Fortune was going to be missing a significant period of time in his children's childhoods. And Robert and Jane had also recently lost their third child, Agnes, in infancy. And this job, which would take him away from his family, also came with inherent dangers. While there was more territory in China open to Britain, there was also, because of the nature of that treaty that Tracy mentioned that was completely one-sided, really, a lot of hostility toward British citizens there in the wake of the First Opium War. Fortune knew that if he really wanted to unlock the secrets of China's tea production, he was going to have to spend years gathering information about it. He needed plants, he needed seeds, and he needed to learn everything he possibly could about the growth, the harvest, and the preparation of tea. He was driven not just by his assignment, but by his own desire to collect new species and expand his own knowledge. And additionally, he was allowed to collect non-tea specimens while he traveled, and he would retain all rights to those discoveries. The East India Company only wanted the tea. Yeah, this is one of those things where he sometimes gets simplified as like a tea thief, and he certainly was doing that mission, but 
for him, there was a much broader appeal that he was a man who wanted to collect plants and he was fascinated by finding different species. That was the whole purpose of his prior travels in China. So it's a little more nuanced than just, I'm going to go sneak in and steal things. Yeah. Uh, he was like, you're going to pay for me to go and explore and find new species for several years? All right. Yeah, he basically had funding for a horticulture expedition, <laughs> provided that he did all this spy work with tea first or yes. during. So Fortune hired two servants in China, both from tea dis- districts. And from their starting point at Shanghai, the servants who would be traveling with him and helping him to enter spaces that he might not otherwise have access to prepared him. He had to leave his European clothes behind and take on the style of the locals. Sort of. Uh, His front hairline was shaved and a braided queue was sewn into the back of his hair. And Fortune wrote of this transformation at the hands of his hired men, quote, They were quite willing to accompany me, only stipulating that I should discard my English costume and adopt the dress of the country. I knew this was indispensable if I wished to accomplish the object in view and readily acceded to the terms. So, thus disguised, Fortune posed as a visitor from a distant province, and his servants would ask entrance into tea factories to observe and collect samples. By the beginning of 1849, he had collected a significant sampling of plants and seeds, and he started trying to send them to India, where he also sent word that he needed updates as to whether the plants arrived safely and whether they and the seeds were planted successfully. Barton was also able to transplant some of his plants to a temporary garden in Shanghai at the Dent Beal & Company Trading Company before sending them on to India. This was not the first time that the British had made efforts to transplant tea from China, but all their previous attempts had failed, and Fortune was very aware that his samples were very fragile, and he also understood the importance of careful transport for them. Yeah, and we're going to get to a really large number of samples that you find out he took. And one of the things that made this so possible is that uh, tea plants are actually pretty easy to root from a cutting. So uh, for our gardeners out there, basically, if you cut a sample from a tea plant and you put it in dirt, it starts developing roots really, really quickly. So that's when we get to these big numbers, I just want you to understand how that was uh, able to be accomplished. On one of his first factory visits, Fortune made a rather unsettling discovery. He realized that Prussian blue and gypsum were being used to add color to green tea that was intended for export to Britain. And this was because the producers of the tea believed that the British preferred their tea to look more evenly green. But of course, they were adding substances that were poisonous to achieve this cosmetic change. And the East India Company would later use this information and samples of the pigment compounds that Fortune sent back to England as a way to show how tea grown and processed by British producers would be superior to imported tea. Fortune's first shipment of 13,000 seedlings met with a bad end. Someone, somewhere along the line, opened the containers that they were shipped in to inspect them. And this was something that Fortune had expressly said should not be done. By the time they reached their destination, all but a thousand of the plants had died of rot, and even the living samples were infested with fungus. The first year of Fortune's work was for nothing, and then on the upside, the first year had also been spent researching green tea. Black tea was the more enticing target, and that was because that was the preferred drink in Britain. So this lost work was not the most important of his work. Fortune headed to provinces known for black tea production next, although at that point he had not yet learned that his samples of green tea had been destroyed. Yeah, it was that long delay in communications that (laughs) caused him to not discover that until sometime later. And the containers that Fortune had been using were called Wardian cases, named after their inventor, Dr. Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward. And the idea behind them was that enclosed glass containers offered plants a self-sustaining environment. This gave Fortune an ingenious idea after that first shipment. He realized that instead of shipping seeds and shipping seedlings, he could plant the seeds in Wardian cases and let them germinate as they made the journey back to India. This method actually worked well, and it let him send better samples that actually arrived in their destination intact. There were so many seedlings in some of the shipments that the men receiving them couldn't get an accurate count. 
The seedlings were moved to soil on plantations in India that were owned by the East India Company, and they thrived there. So despite these early setbacks, Fortune's work for the company wound up being a huge success. And Fortune continued his sample gathering for the remainder of his trip. This was all still happening really in the first half. Uh, And when he wrapped up his business finally in Shanghai, he actually took more than plants out of the country with him. He had had acquaintances in China recruit a team of eight young men who were experts in growing and processing tea. And though these men were reluctant to trust foreigners, with some assistance and a bit of pressure, Fortune was able to get them to agree to a three-year contract, during which they would train the men on the Indian plantations in the best ways to handle their plants and their harvest. This was, to be clear, a completely uneven contract. The workers were getting paid probably a decent amount compared to what their other options might be, but they were also pledging to pay a massive default sum if they were unable to fulfill their duties for any reason. So basically, if they got sick in those three years and couldn't do their work, they had to pay $100, which at the time was huge, especially compared to what they were getting paid. It was really not fair or kind in any way. These men traveled to Darjeeling in the Lesser Himalayas just as the plant samples had, and they shared their knowledge, which had been kept for generations only in China, with the workers on the British-owned plantations. The tea industry from there underwent a massive shift. Soon, tea cuttings were cultivated in other countries as well as India, but India's production was massive, and they could export quality teas at a lower price, taking the market share away from China. This happened really quickly over the course of like a decade. And then China spent the next hundred years trying to catch up and finally once again became the largest exporter of tea in the 1950s. By the time Robert Fortune died in April 13th, 1880, it's estimated that he had introduced about 280 plant species to the Western world from China. There are more than a dozen plant species named after him. And since the 1980s, there have been a lot of think pieces published heralding the end of tea's dominance in Great Britain. Coffee has gained in popularity in that time, but tea, as we mentioned at the top of the show, still far outpaces it. Uh, I ran into a few different articles predicting when coffee would surpass tea as the main beverage of Great Britain, but those are all, you know, predictions. (laughs) I don't know. I think even if coffee does surpass tea as the most popular beverage, the the association of tea with British culture is so entrenched. Um, I I can't speak for how entrenched it is within Britain, but outside of Britain, it's like they're so parallel that I think even outside of the country, people will probably associate tea with Britain long after. It is not the most popular beverage. Well, and I also suspect that even if it somehow is surpassed by coffee, it's not like it's going to go away. It will still be part of of British culture. And I think tea has gotten more popular in other countries as well. I feel like in the United States, this is just experiential. I don't have data on it. Um, You know, I have certainly noticed that tea has become much more prevalent in, for example, office break rooms than it ever used to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, So. You know, a tea's safe. We're always going to want tea. It's delicious. It is delicious. Delicious. Do you have delicious listener mail? Oh, I have beautiful listener mail. It oh, is from yay. our listener, Rebecca. She writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, from an avid Stuff You Missed in History class fan, hello. I've been listening to the show almost since the beginning. I work as a custom picture framer, and I do some freelance illustration work on the side. Your podcast has gotten me through many, many long hours of framing and drawing. For a few years now, I've, do- I've been doing a monthly series every March featuring notable women of history. Stuff You Missed in History class has been an amazing source of inspiration, information, and entertainment. So as a thank you, I've included two drawings from the series, one for each of you. For Holly, previous podcast subject, Lillian Bland. You have her chutzpah, her creativity, and her zest for life. For Tracy, previous podcast mentioned, Timoe Gozen. You have her drive, resilience, and courage. Enjoy, and if you're interested, check out the full series at rebeccarobby.myportfolio.com. Keep up the amazing work. You are very much appreciated. Oh, Tracy, these are beautiful. So this is yet another time where I get to reveal a thing to Tracy. What? And I want to do it carefully because her, Rebecca is astonishingly talented. 
Uh, well, and while you carefully do that, I want to say that was an incredibly flattering and kind email. Thank it you. It really was. So um, I want to put this in a place you can see it. What? It's That's beautiful. so beautiful. Her work is gorgeous. Uh, I am in love with it. So I'm excited because I'm actually kind of redoing my bathroom right now to be a ladies' room. So it's just filled with framed pieces of art of cool ladies. Nice. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's going to be a perfect and prominent piece of that. So thank you so much, Rebecca. I am touched and delighted. And it is, as Tracy said, such an amazingly lovely note to get. Uh, so if you would like to write to us, you can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. You can find us all over social media as Missed in History. And MissedInHistory.com is how you find us on the World Wide Web. And there you'll find episodes all the way back to the beginning of the podcast before Tracy and I were ever involved, as well as show notes on the podcast that Tracy and I have worked on together and uh, occasional other little goodies. So come and visit us at MissedInHistory.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 